Here's what's coming up on episode 63 of the Big Seance Podcast. Karen Frazier. Plus, we made it on the final slate of nominees for the podcast awards. So exciting. Like I'd be, when I was a little kid, I'd be confused. I'd come downstairs in the middle of the night and say to my mom and dad, things like, I want to go home now. And they'd be like, you are home. What do you mean? Oh <laughs> so, so um, and when I was in college, I thought I was insane when I lived in the dorms or in apartments because I had all of these emotions that were related to nothing that was going on in my life. Um, and it wasn't until I moved to a house in the woods off by myself that I that it stopped. And I realized, oh, wait, these were other people's things. How psychics or mediums are involved in paranormal investigation. Oh, you said involved. You listened to my show. I know. And and I know that sometimes the phrase is how are psychics used? Yes, you don't use in, people. How do you use your strengths in paranormal research and, and how are you involved? It is a wonderfully haunted place. It's a ridiculously haunted place. I recommend people go stay there because it's also just, you'll sleep better. I sleep terrible in hotels. I sleep like a baby in this place. <laughs> and the spirits there are really loving and protective and healing. And it's it's just a really wonderful place. And it's not a scary haunted place. It's a lovely haunted place. And um, I don't mind going here because I, I feel like if my journey can help people either understand how they can go about theirs or make them feel less alone, um, then it's, it's really important to talk about, in my opinion. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Welcome back. I hope that wherever you are right now, whatever it is that you're doing as you're listening, I hope that you're having a fabulous day. And if you need a little help to get to that point, I think I have a great episode for you just to help you out. Before we get to that, though, I want to share some exciting news that was announced just this last weekend. You may remember me recently bringing up the topic of the People's Choice Podcast Awards. And maybe, just maybe, I begged you for nominations. And just so you know, this isn't something where one nomination gets you on the list. It takes many nominations, and then there's a complicated review process. I've followed these podcast awards for a few years, even before I was a podcaster and just a listener. And I've seen some very successful shows on the final slate of nominees. And sometimes just being on that slate of nominees is enough to bring in many new listeners who didn't know that this show, in whatever niche they hang out in, even existed. And so I honestly had no idea if I was getting people excited over nothing or if there was even a chance at all that we'd make it to the final slate. Well, the Big Seance Podcast made it. We're one of 10 podcasts nominated in the science and medicine category. And I know that seems weird, but that's where we tend to get placed. But I was absolutely thrilled and shocked and still very giddy, actually, about even making it onto the list. And I have you, my loyal Paranerd listener, to thank for it. Many of you let me know that you took the time to nominate us, and for that, I thank you. I was hopeful that our friends at the History Goes Bump podcast would make it on the list, but that was not the case. But Diane and Denise, the hosts of History Goes Bump, did give a shout out to the big seance on their most recent episode and encouraged their listeners to lend their support. That was very kind of you ladies, so I want to thank you. So what does this mean now and what happens next? Well, beginning on Sunday, May 29th of 2016, that's this coming Sunday if you're listening, you know, fairly currently, 
The voting will commence and will last for 15 days. Listeners can go to podcastawards.com and vote once a day. Now, this is the important part. Ultimately, listeners of the nominated podcasts, or in this case, Paranerds, will determine who the winner will be. So go to podcastawards.com on May 29th and to begin voting daily. And when you go there, you can check out some other cool podcasts that are on the list. In fact, I'd like to recommend you also vote for two other podcasts from other categories while you're there. These are podcasters who are friends and supporters of the show. In the arts category, I recommend a very cool podcast called Craft Lit. Heather is the host of Craft Lit, and she has been known to listen to the Big Seance podcast. Craft Lit is a place for crafty chat while having fun with classic literature. From the GLBT category, please consider voting for Cocktails and Cream Puffs. My buddy Joey Buhecker produces this podcast, and he is also a big seance listener. Cocktails and Cream Puffs is um, a, a rather mature and explicit podcast, so I had to throw that out there. It's a gay comedy pop culture podcast out of Buffalo, New York. And I guarantee it's as crazy and funny as you think it is. So get to podcastawards.com on May 29th and every day after that to vote. Get your neighbors to vote. Get your book club to vote. Get your therapist to vote. Get your Tupperware party to vote. Is there a ghost or two hanging around your place? I know there is. Try it out. You know, if we can get phone calls from the dead, there's always a chance we can get online votes from the dead as well. So on to the main event in the parlor today. My fun conversation with Karen Frazier. I have a feeling you're going to learn a few things today. And yes, there's another audio issue of the Spectral Edition coming your way as well. And um, light a few extra candles for this one, okay? Or maybe even just turn on the lights. So with me today is a familiar voice to me, and perhaps to you too, if you are a regular listener of Paranormal Underground Radio in the Dark. I'm talking about Karen Frazier. Karen Frazier is also the author of five paranormal metaphysical books. She is a columnist for Paranormal Underground Magazine, and she investigates with South Sound Paranormal Research. She has appeared on the Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum, spoken at regional conferences, including the Oregon Ghost Conference, Haunting for Hope, Port Gamble Ghost Conference, and Paracon Seattle, and appeared on numerous radio shows. Karen is an intuitive energy healer, and just just know she's studied and is certified in just about every area, as far as I can see. She teaches uh, classes in energy healing, Reiki, and psychic development. She's also an ordained minister for the International Metaphysical Ministry. She holds a Bachelor of Metaphysical Science and a Master's of Metaphysical Science from University of Metaphysics and a Ph.D. in Metaphysical Parapsychology from the University of Sedona. She is currently working towards her Doctor of Divinity, specializing in spiritual healing at University of Metaphysics. She volunteers at the haunted Lewis County Historical Museum, and in her personal life, she enjoys cooking, hiking, yoga, Nia, I'll have to figure out what Nia is, <laughs> tribal belly dance, and making music. Hi, Karen. Hi there. I sound like such a hippie chick, don't I? <laughs> hey, that's cool, man. I'm actually really a normal person. <laughs> you know what? I think that's one of the reasons why I resonate with you is you're just, you are so funny on the show and you have such a quick wit and... Yet you're always so informative, too. I feel like 
I learn something from you every time I listen to your show. Oh, well, that's great. So we're going to get all kinds of paranormal goodness today. But first, I know enough about you to know that you have a major passion for writing. So who are you as a writer? Um, well, it, it depends on the day and depends on the project. And, and, and to some extent, it also depends on who's paying me. Um, <laughs> although not nearly as much as it used to. So I've been a writer for my entire career. And I started out doing patient education materials in a natural health clinic many years ago. Actually, before that, I started out uh, writing personal training materials and working as a personal trainer in a health club. And um, every job I've ever had has become a writing job for me. And then I moved into corporate America and spent about 10 years in the corporate world, uh, which is just as dreadful as it sounds, (laughs) writing marketing copy about products. And just was really unhappy and unfulfilled. And luckily for me, although it didn't seem lucky at the time, 2008 happened. And the first people that got fired in 2008 were the creatives. <laughs> so, mm. because creative, apparently creatives are, are <laughs> not really, not really considered necessary when a company is struggling to get by and doesn't have any money. So um, luckily for me, I was laid off and was forced to, Uh, and I say forced joyfully, not angrily, to go into freelance writing full time. And so I spent many years writing for whoever would pay me because, as you know, 2008 happened. And and it was, um, you know, we just had to make a living. We had two young kids. We had a huge mortgage and all of that. And um, slowly since 2008, I have shifted the mix of my writing to writing about things that I want to write about that still tend to at least uh, pay for my son's college education, if nothing else. So I, it used to be marketing stuff for anybody who needed marketing stuff. I used to write PR materials for, for a company called reputation.com, which is, you know, it, it fixes people's reputations on the internet. And what I found when I was doing that was it was a bunch of crooks and a bunch of a lot of people in the financial world who needed to rehab their images. And um, that was unfulfilling. And not only was it unfulfilling, but it just felt dishonest to me to be doing this. Icky. Icky. It felt icky. And so I shifted and have been really lucky and blessed in that now what I do is I write cookbooks um, for people on special diets, uh, which is great because I have all sorts of special nutritional needs myself. I have celiac disease and I have autoimmune disease and I have all these things where the way I eat is very important because it makes me healthy as opposed to making me feel really sick all the time. And so I get to take all of the stuff that I've spent all of my life knowing about and learning about through my natural health work and my personal training work and my nutrition coaching work and all of that and compile it into um, these cookbooks. And that's my bread and butter. But then my passion is also writing about paranormal, metaphysical, and spiritual. But what I found is, I just found this out, my publisher of the cookbook said, hey, we need you to separate these two things out so people don't get confused it, to your identity. So you need to have two brands and they need to be separate. You need to have the cookbook brand, and cookbook and nutrition brand, and you need to have the paranormal and spiritual brand. And there's so much crossover between the two that it's almost impossible for me to do that. But I did it. And, you know, I thought about you recently because there's a a person very close to me in my life who has uh, just discovered that they have the celiac stuff going on. And so it's a whole journey trying to to figure that out and the diet. And absolutely crazy. Have them put them in contact with me. I'm happy to help. I went through it. Um, I had to do it with a young family. And, you know, young boys and a husband who didn't eat anything green and, and all of that stuff. And so I really have navigated those waters. So seriously, put them in contact with me. I'd be happy to help. I know how tough it can be. I will. You rock. So, Karen, how would you describe your intuitive abilities? <laughs> that's actually really hard for me because I fought against describing them at all for many years. So I've had them all of my life. Um, and I'm a person who tends to resist labels. So I call myself an intuitive energy healer, but I think it's all part of the same spectrum of being a psychic and being a medium. So, um, I talk to dead people. Um, I, we're cool with that here. We love that. Yeah, Just yeah. FYI. <laughs> I would hope so. I am. And they talk back. I hear them. Um, I am empathic. 
So that means I take on other people's emotions, uh, things like that. I am medically intuitive, which means that I can pick up on people's illnesses um, or at least where they physiologically, spiritually, and emotionally have blockages that are affecting their health. I am clairvoyant. I hear things. I'm clair, uh, clair, or I see things, excuse me. I'm clairaudient. I hear things. I'm clairsentient, which means I just know things. I call it my psychic downloads where I'll be walking through, for instance, I do walkthroughs for South Sound Paranormal Research and I'll be walking through a, a haunted location and I will just know everything. It's like all of a sudden, bam, I know this whole story. Um, that's my actual favorite because I don't have to work real hard at that. <laughs> Um, and I, I can do psychometry so I can feel energies with my hands. Um, I have a little bit of everything. And that is so fast. The medical stuff is fascinating to me too, how some people have that ability and some people don't. Mm, I think that we all have it because the medical intuitive, so you have all of your clairs, which are how you receive information, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the ways that that can manifest. So, for instance, being a medium isn't actually a psychic ability. It's a way a psychic ability manifests. Mm. Or being medically intuitive isn't um, a psychic ability in its, of itself. It's a way that psychic abilities can manifest. So since I believe everyone is psychic, I believe it's just where we put our attention. And have these developed over the years or have you oh, had yeah. it from the time you you can remember? I've always had it. Uh, I had an imaginary friend when I was a kid. I used to have dreams about past life. I used to be um, really confused or uh, like I'd be when I was a little kid, I'd be confused. I'd come downstairs in the middle of the night and say to my mom and dad things like, I want to go home now. And they'd be like, you are home. What do you mean? Oh <laughs> so, so um, and when I was in college, I thought I was insane when I lived in the dorms or in apartments because I had all of these emotions that were related to nothing that was going on in my life. Um, and it wasn't until I moved to a house in the woods off by myself that I that it stopped. And I realized, oh, wait, these were other people's things. Mm. So it's developed over my life. But I spent a good 25 years really denying that it existed. And what was it that kind of made you accept it? Was there any moment or you just? I had a lot of trouble getting out of my own way. I had a lot of trouble getting out of my rational brain and getting out of ego, which is, I think, what blocks people with their psychic abilities. It's that we're ego identified and um, we're trained to be rational, critical thinkers, which is necessary and important, absolutely, um, in this world. <laughs> But when you're working with intuitive and psychic abilities, you have to learn to get out of your own way. And so for me, really what it was, um, was when I started writing for the magazine for Paranormal Underground, and I started exploring haunted locations, and it just really became undeniable to me that, that I was getting verifiable information. And so Wellington was really the kicker for me that made me realize this is it. I understand. I have these abilities. And then I spent years not, not allowing myself to identify what those were just saying, well, yeah, there's something there, but it's not a big deal. And it's only been in the past maybe four years that I thought, okay, I, I've got to work with this. This is a gift. And so I need to actually start acknowledging it and, and deal with it. And that is so funny to me because there are, uh, I mean, meaning the people who are struggling to accept it because there's so many of us, me included, who for like a whole year or two, uh, you know, 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago, I was obsessed with learning about uh, intuitive abilities and reading about channeling and psychic yeah. abilities. And, and you know, there was are some of us that would just love to be that psychic nerd, but we're psychic as a rock. So uh, <laughs> yeah, but here's. Here's what I would tell you about that is that when you say I'm as psychic as a rock, you're creating an energy and you're creating an intention within your life. And so it's really, it's self-protective to say, hey, I'm as psychic as a rock or my husband, I uh, can't even remember what he says, but he says something like I'm a psychic brick wall. And we have a gal on our, our team who always says that we call her the cooler. She's a psychic cooler. Um, <laughs> And But you create that, that self-protective, because then you never have to step outside of that because you have mm. created this definition of yourself. And we are how we, we are what we define ourselves to be. What we say we are manifests in our lives. So every time you say that, 
what you're saying is universe, I don't want to deal with these abilities because I'm not, I, I, I don't want to take that risk. I don't want to step outside of that because I might be embarrassed or I might fall down. Or- I, I guess you're right. I've had people tell me that before. And I think maybe part <laughs> of it is, is uh, kind of like, you know, along with the lines of meditation or whatever, sometimes mm-hmm. you just get lazy. And you yeah. don't want to put, put the effort. <laughs> well, and you don't it. have you don't have to. Um, I hope that didn't sound when I said that to you like oh, a dress no, no. down because it's certainly not. Uh it's it's a you know, you don't have to, but if you're fascinated with it and you're drawn to it and you're interested in it, then the first thing you need to do is change the fact that you say I'm not psychic or I'm psychic as a rock or however you say it, even if you say it jokingly, to actually putting out there in the universe, I am developing my psychic abilities. My psychic abilities are developing or some positive statement. And it doesn't have to be, well, I'm psychic as John Edward. I mean, you don't have to do that. (laughs) But just to open that door a little bit. And once you start to open that door, I think you'd be surprised. And this is cool because I... I think that some of the more interesting chatter on paranormal underground radio in the dark that I hear has been just recently between you and Chucky e. G, your co-host, <laughs> about him. He's is it accurate to say he's kind of coming into some newly understood <laughs> intuitive abilities? Is that what a good he, way to put it? Yeah, he actually kind of had to be dragged kicking and screaming a little bit. Um, and I think he would agree with that. Where in the beginning, he did what a lot of people do, which is, oh, my God, I don't want to deal with this. And he was going through some stuff in his life uh, with his relationships where the people that he was in relationship to weren't open to that. And therefore, it felt very uncomfortable and risky to step out of that. And yet he was having these undeniable experiences. And so I had, you know, what you hear, Chuck and I, the conversations you hear us have on the air is really just a few hours of hundreds of hours of conversation (laughs) that we we share over the course of the time that we've spent together because we're very close friends Mm -hmm. and I spent hours with him saying Chuck trust you just have to trust and the reason that I could give that advice is because that's exactly what I had to start doing Mm. hi Chucky G if you're listening (laughs) (laughs) so is it the writing that eventually kind of pulled you in more into the research and kind of involved in the metaphysical that's what I assumed that maybe the writing kind of pulled you in that direction. When did you really jump in full on to a lot of the work that you're doing now? 2010, hmm. six years ago. Um, and that really had to do with Wellington more than the writing. When I first went to Wellington, um, which is a haunted location here in Washington state, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I didn't have any intention of writing a book, but I wanted to go and explore this place. And we thought we were going to make a documentary about it because that that's a fun way for me of telling stories. I love film editing and film writing and filmmaking. So I guess it was a writing project all along, but it wasn't writing a book. And um, the documentary that we were planning on doing up there fell apart. And I, while I was mourning this loss of this creative baby that I was trying to give birth to, I, I thought, ah, I can write a book. Um, so, so, yeah, that 2010 is when it really started, 2009, 2010. But why? Um, because my spirit told me it was time. Because I couldn't not anymore. Because I, I had to. Mm-hmm. And I'm a lifelong learner. I am an education whore. <laughs> I will <laughs> I will learn about anything. I will learn in any way that's it's available. I love change. I love new things. I love learning things. I love new information. I'm an information nerd. And so I'll learn about anything. And um this was what my spirit was saying it's time for you to learn about and so I did. That's awesome. And you write a lot about what you're learning. I am pretty prolific. I'm very lucky in that I have the platform of Paranormal Underground Magazine and, of course, Paranormal Underground Radio in the Dark. I get to talk about it every week. I get to write about it every month. And I think I do drive Cheryl, our publisher, a little nuts, our (laughs) editor-in-chief and publisher, because I'm all over the place. So I'll start a column, and I'll be like, after about six months of the column, I'll be like, yeah, but I want to write a column about this instead. But if I have four columns, that's too many. So I need to get rid of, you know, (laughs) so I, but what it's given me is this nice um, stable of things that I can write about, talk about, teach classes about, and I don't get bored. 
I know that when it comes to paranormal investigation and sometimes how, and I think you've talked about this on the show, but how psychics or mediums are involved in paranormal investigation. Oh, you said involved. You've listened to my show. I know. And and I know that sometimes the phrase is how are psychics used? Yes. In, you don't use in, people. Yeah. So I, I want, and, and it's, it's funny that, uh, I just, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question. How, you know, uh, how do you use your strengths in paranormal research and, and how are you involved? Well, that has sort of evolved over the years as well. So, and as a matter of fact, our team, South Sound Paranormal Research, is really kind of in conversation now about how I wish to be involved as opposed to how I was involved in the past because I came on as an investigator many years ago, five, six years ago, 2010, maybe. I don't know. I've been with them a while. Mm -hmm. And so when I first came onto the team, I just came on as an investigator. But what I discovered quickly, because it was during not the psychic awakening, but my psychic, because I've always been psychic, but the psychic acknowledgement, I guess it was during this period that I came onto the team. And the team quickly shifted from me being an investigator, because let's face it, I'm kind of a disaster as an investigator. You've probably heard me say on the show many times, I'm not allowed to touch the equipment. <laughs> I am just I, I'm not the most grounded person in the world. When you called me earlier, I told you I almost hum, hung up on you because I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. So originally what I was really good at, and I still am, is I can hear EVPs. I can pick out an EVP really well. Um, so they used me. I'm sorry. I know I used my own word I don't like, but they, they used <laughs> my skills and talents with that as a great way to uh, incorporate with the team because I was better at that than anybody else. And now it's really evolved from that where I'm still good at picking out the EVPs. I think part of the reason I'm good at picking them out is because I know when they're coming. Mm. And so I know when to listen because I was there when the questioning was going on and things. So I was going and doing walkthroughs for the team before before the investigation. Yeah. We would have a client call and they would say, okay, well, we need somebody to come do a walkthrough. And I would go do the walkthrough of the place and I would do the initial phone consultation with the the family and have conversations like, um, well, what would you like to see out of this? And what we discovered is that I was not sending a lot of investigations to the team because I could just take care of stuff immediately. Mm. <laughs> and in some cases that's that's what's called for but i almost never said to anybody hey your place needs an investigation because i i could help them i could you know whether it was latent psychic abilities that they were dealing with or whether it was an energy that just needed somebody to talk to them or you know just so they just needed somebody to coach them to say hey shut up leave us alone which works <laughs> you know that type of thing and so i wasn't sending the team a lot of investigations and and they were really lovely about it because our team believes not everybody needs an investigation. You don't want to stir up that energy, right? Yeah. But at the same time, I was starting to feel guilty about it. I kept thinking, God, I'm depriving of these people. They want to investigate, and I'm coming in and going, no, I'll fix it now. And <laughs> you know, all of that stuff. So what it is currently evolving to what it looks like is that I will be attending investigations as the team psychic along with um, Andy Skinner, who is uh, a good friend of mine who I've kind of been mentoring as he's been developing his abilities. And that we will go in and, and if they feel they need the psychics there, because some people aren't comfortable with that, I will go in and use that ability. And then I will work with the spirits and with the people in a counseling capacity to help them to find the resolutions that they need to be able to either cohabit peacefully or if the spirits need to uh, have something resolved so that they can move along their paths or even if it's somebody who has psychic abilities or just energy outbursts that's causing poltergeist activity I can do all of those things it's I so I kind of work in a, a counseling capacity now I suppose well, I can also imagine that you would save your team some time in some cases. If I think back to my time in paranormal investigation by maybe coming back and saying, uh, there's nothing there. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, but every once in a while I would miss one. Mm. So I can remember, for instance, one where I, when I was doing the case management and I went and did the walkthrough and they had stuff genuinely going on in this house. And, but I just, and I never say this to people, but I said, we'll schedule an investigation, but 
Your kids can't be here. You can't have any friends here. It just needs to be you, you, just you. And I said that to them, and I almost never say that, but I clearly had some inkling that I needed to say that to them. Well, we got there. The team got there. We set up. All of their friends were there. Their kids had friends spending the night. They proceeded yep. to all drink wine and yep. we were evenings entertainment. I mean, and and I clearly had an inkling that this was what was going to happen because I never say that. <laughs> and yet I still took the team there for an investigation. So <laughs> I didn't save them time is what I'm telling you. <laughs> so other than your normal intuitive abilities that, that you've explained really well, do you practice any kind of spirit communication or divination regularly, or do you, do you refrain from those things? Um, so I, you mean like, do I do seances or, yeah, or, or, a tarot card? Or, board or, or any of those things? Um, so we play with some things like that, not when we're working with clients, but we have a, a place that as a team, we get to go a lot, the haunted Lewis County historical museum here in town. And, um, it's kind of our place. And so we will do some of that stuff there. But we don't do it with clients because Ouija boards tend to scare the poop out of people. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, we've worked with Ouija boards. I, I believe that Ouija boards in and of themselves are just a Parker Brothers game. Mm-hmm. And that it's no different than doing EVPs or anything else. And therefore, what's dangerous is if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to close those things off. Um, and you don't know how to protect your energy from what you're inviting in. But I can invite something in by sitting in my living room just trying to talk to. So I, I do a little of that. I, um, I will read tarot for people if they want me to, but it's not something I do a lot. Um, I teach it in my classes just because I can and because people are interested in that. But, you know, I don't even do, I don't even really do a lot of readings for people. I, I have people who ask me to do a reading and I will, but I don't, I don't work as a psychic medium who has clients and gets paid and all of that. Not that there's anything wrong with people doing that, but that's just not the capacity that I use these abilities. So talk to us uh, about a few of the haunted locations that you hit on in your books, like maybe the, the old Wheeler hotel, for example. All right. Well, the old Wheeler hotel is a book that is not out yet, but it's coming out. The book will be called permanent, the permanence, the ghosts of the old Wheeler hotel. It's a bed and breakfast down on the Oregon coast in Wheeler, Oregon, a uh, adorable place. So many people walk in and it just feels like home. And um, my good friend Katie owns the hotel and she has really opened it up to those of us in the paranormal community that she feels comfortable with. And, uh, so I've spent a lot of time there and it is a wonderfully haunted place. It's a ridiculously haunted place. I recommend people go stay there because it's also just, you'll sleep better. I sleep terrible in hotels. I sleep like a baby in this place (laughs) and the spirits there are really loving and protective and healing. And it's, it's just a really wonderful place and it's not a scary haunted place. It's a lovely haunted place. And then, so Wellington, which I mentioned briefly, is up in the Cascades here in Washington State, and it is the site of the deadliest avalanche disaster in the history of the United States. It killed about 100 people, and it's a rails-to-trails hiking trail now, so it's open to the public. Anybody can go there, although uh, unless you have a four-wheel drive or a snowmobile, you really can't go there until about the beginning of July or the end of June, beginning of July. And there are a ton of spirits there. And the history there is great. If you're a history buff, uh, the history there is amazing. And you can feel the history and the trail is marked with with historical markers. Um, It's an old ghost town. I mean, it just has everything that you want if you really want to sink your teeth into history, right? Yeah. And plus it's haunted. So that's a pretty cool place. And then um, the other place that I've written about is the Lewis County Historical Museum here in Chehalis, Washington. And it's an old train depot. And it's pretty fabulous, too. I think that people always ask me, well, is it the location or is it the artifacts? And I just always say, yes. Yes, it's all of that. And we've, as South Sound Paranormal Research has investigated there for eight years, I think, now. And we've been really fortunate to have this place. So these are the three places that that I go to get my ghost fix, to go get my ghost on. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's awesome. Uh, let's chat about the show a little bit. And for those 
who haven't listened yet or don't know what we're talking about it. We're talking about the Paranormal Underground Radio in the Dark, and it's been around for for years. And you've been involved from the beginning, and you're getting ready to have your 300th show. I think you said in July. So what you? Yeah, think? yeah. I I can't tell you the date right off the top of my head. I think it's like the second Thursday in July, and it's on MixLR. We just recently, well, recently, I say it's been like a year now. We switched over to MixLR because we like the the ability to broadcast when we want and things like that. Instead of having to be part of somebody else's radio lineup, mm-hmm. we can, we could do whatever we want with it. So we like the freedom associated with that. It's a, it's a great radio platform it has a chat room and things. And so it's, it's a fun show. I co-host, I used to co-host. Um, well, originally it started out, we called it, I think we just called it Paranormal Underground Podcast or something or Paranormal Underground Presents or something. And I was the one who produced those and got all the guests and lined everything up and hosted. And they would be these big three-hour extravaganzas where we would interview somebody and then we would have a roundtable discussion after we after they hung up. So we'd basically talk about them behind their backs. Um, <laughs> and that was a fun format. And that was a podcast that wasn't live. And Chad, who is one of the publishers of the magazine, kept saying, I want to do live radio. And I kept saying, oh, my God, I can't line up a guest every week. And I can't do that. I mean, that's such a big commitment, doing it every week. And we finally, um, about a year after doing the podcast, we switched over, found a radio network. And, um, well, the radio network found us and said, hey, we've heard your podcast. We'd really like you to come do this live. And we thought, well, okay, because Cheryl said, I'll line up all the guests. And I was like, sold. (laughs) <laughs> so we switched over to the weekly live format and my co-host at the time was Rick Hale. Yeah. Who's yeah. A, yeah. Who's a great author and great radio host and um, used to write for the paranormal underground magazine as well. And uh, just a massive knowledge as far as, as par- the paranormal goes, he's been doing it since he was like two or something. <laughs> I mean, so, mm-hmm. um, and so we did that. I host co-hosted with Rick for many years and I think Chuck started maybe a year ago, two years ago, a year and a half ago, something like that. Um, Just for me, it it was people, because people have said, well, why did you stop hosting with Rick? Well, I love Rick. Um, I just was ready to do something different. Mm -hmm. And so we switched over to having Chuck as the co-host and Chuck brings a whole different level of personality and knowledge. And he, then Rick did. And so it's like a whole new show to me. And it's, it's a great show. We get to interview people. We get to interact with our listeners if they want. Um, we're, we're really lucky. I, I am really blessed that I've had this show that I've had so much fun with and that we've had quite a bit of success with for the past seven years or something. Now you've got me wanting – I, I have to confess I have not been to the archives to hear the whole round table uh talk behind people's backs discussions <laughs> yeah that sounds cool yeah our very first guest was stanton friedman wow that's yeah. quite a guest for the first one he well and he was fabulous i love stanton because he's a he he's a walking sound bite but what's really funny if you is if you go back and you listen to that show we were terrible <laughs> we were green. We didn't know what we were doing. There was nothing organic about it. We thought, well, maybe we need to script this, at least this, the the beginning and the, you know, and have questions prepared and all of that. And what I found for me is that I work better off the cuff and I always have. And so Chuck prepares for every show. And thank God he does, because <laughs> I don't even know who the guest is until I sign into the chat room that night, or we start, we, we have about 20 minutes before the show that we talk, talk and Cheryl will be like, now, do you know who's we guest, who the guest is this week? And I'll be like, no, <laughs> <laughs> because I like the really organic off the cuff conversations. I come up with much more interesting questions than if I prepare. Well, and I think maybe that's why you blend so well and get along so well and it works so well for you. Yeah, probably so. Because Chuck is super prepared, and I I love and appreciate that about him. (laughs) What are some of your favorite types of episodes, or or who have been some of your favorite guests? Hmm. Well, Stanton Friedman uh, is one of my favorite guests. My very favorite guest is was Dr. Raymond Moody, who's been on the show either two or three times. Oh, yeah. I just what a get for a guest, right? Yeah. He's, he's just incredible for people who don't know. Raymond Moody is the life after life guy. He's the guy who actually 
did the initial research for past or not past life, um, near death experiences and mm-hmm. ca- came up with the categories and the, the signs of what they are, you know, the walking down the hallway, the tunnel and the light and the loved ones. And that's all Raymond Moody. And he has always been kind of a personal hero for me because when I was about 13 years old, and I'd had all these little weird experiences, but kept it to myself. My dad handed me a book and said, read this. I think you'll find it really interesting. And it was life Aww. after life. Yeah, it was life after life. And it started everything. So Raymond Moody started everything. How cool of your dad. He was the start of everything. And I've always just really admired him. I've read everything the guy's ever written. And so he hands down, not to take away from anything from any of the other fabulous guests we've had because we've had incredible guests over the years but Raymond Moody was just another level for me yeah I'm kind of jealous I've tried to get Dr. <laughs> Moody but I I don't know I guess I don't bug people enough <laughs> yeah well that was all Cheryl I mean there's some people we've tried to get that uh, that we haven't been able to the biggest one that I've always wanted to talk to is Michael Newton. Do you know who that is? I don't think so right off the top he, of my head. Uh, do you know of the books Journey of Souls and Destiny of Souls? He's a pioneer in life between lives hypnotherapy research. Mm. I would recommend the books Journey of Souls and Destiny of Souls. Mm. Fascinating stuff. And uh, he's up there with for me with Dr. Moody, but he's retired. So he sent us a thing and said, well, I can't come on, but here, let me recommend this person to you. And so somebody came on in his, in his place, and she was fabulous, and I can't for the life of me remember her name. Um, I like people that come on that are – outside of the typical ghost shows and the typical paranormal investigation shows. I like people that come on that really make me think about things in a different way or talk about topics that I just geek out on, like people who come in and want to talk about quantum physics or oh. reincarnation, <laughs> things like that. I just, I, I love that stuff. My head starts exploding as soon as yeah, you say that word. Yeah, the best. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you don't you don't have to go here if you don't want to, but you've blogged recently about getting your life back after overcoming quite a few health obstacles. I think some that we've already talked about. Mm-hmm. How how did you get here? Uh how did I get my life back? Yeah. Uh well, so just really quickly, I spent about 25 years undiagnosed but with something clearly very wrong. And um, I don't mind going here because I, I feel like if my journey can help people either understand how they can go about theirs or make them feel less alone, um, then it's it's really important to talk about, in my opinion. So so I'm kind of tend to be an open book about stuff like that. Uh, so I appreciate you asking the question. Um, so I, when I was undiagnosed for all of these years, I had a whole host of issues, a terrible um, gastrointestinal, you know, almost lay on the floor of the bathroom several days a week kind of stuff, incredible weakness, poor sleep. Um, it, it led to extreme obesity. I was a very active person. I was a personal trainer and aerobics instructor and just incredibly energetic. And one day it was like a light switch flipped and All of that energy, it was like all of that life force just drained away and I started feeling terrible and I gained 150 pounds. And for somebody who was always active and slim, that was really confusing. And what was even more confusing was the way that then I was treated when I went to see doctors Mm -hmm. because all of a sudden I was no longer a person worthy of them trying to figure out what was going on. I was a fat person who and all they wanted to do was talk about how fat I was and every every single recommendation was well, was basically well lose weight fatty I mean that was it and that was very frustrating and demoralizing and really kind of robbed me of my spirit and I realized that I needed to take control of that and I needed to start to advocate for myself so I started doing research and I started doing a ton of research And with my background in natural health and my background in nutrition and exercise and things, I I knew where to go and what to look for and that type of thing. And yet it still took me 25 years before I finally talked a doctor into giving me a test because I was pretty sure I knew what things were wrong with me. And I talked, finally talked to doctor after years of begging doctors to give me tests that they would say, you don't need that. You're just fat or whatever. Honest to God, I heard that all the time. Wow. 
And they started to test me. Um, I had one doctor who tested me for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, who tested me for celiac disease. And lo and behold, found that I had these things that I had been saying I had all along. So the first step was that they put me on thyroid medication. And that helped a lot. That changed a lot of things just because now my body was producing thyroid hormones the way they were supposed to. Uh, But at the same time, that wasn't enough. I still remained overweight. I still had no energy, but at least I didn't feel like I wanted to die most days, (laughs) you know? (laughs) So, um, I, I then started researching the types of diet that I needed to be on for having Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease. And so I started researching that to find out what I needed to do to reduce the symptoms of of the autoimmune disease. And what I discovered is that with autoimmune disease, most of the symptoms arise from inflammation in your body. And honestly, as I've done more research, inflammation is the cause of so much. It's the cause of heart disease. I'm certain of it. It's the cause of all sorts of things. It's really bad stuff in your body. Your body needs inflammation to recover from acute illness and injury. But when it becomes chronic, it can cause a lot of problems. So I discovered the way to eat for anti-inflammatory diet. And I also discovered for me that I'm very sensitive to carbs and sugar. So what I did is I put myself on a low carb paleo style diet. And I know the paleo diet gets knocked a lot, but basically I went on meat and vegetables and fruit and that's what I eat. And it has made all the difference in the world. It took me about a year to start feeling better. I have reduced my medication I need to take by a full two thirds. So I'm, I have, I'm taking one third of what I used to take in my medication. Um, I've lost 145 pounds. I've been able to return to exercise. You mentioned in my, in my intro that I do the NIA and I can tell you what that is. It's a, it's, it's a, a form of dance. Mm. It's, but it's a form of dance fitness. So I, I do the NIA and I do yoga and I do the belly dance and I get out and walk and I hike and, and all of these things that I've tried to do all of these years that just made me sicker are finally enriching my life again because I'm eating the right foods and I'm not eating gluten, which is the reason that I would lay on my bathroom floor many days out of the week. And, So yeah, it's just been a process of slowly, it was like this knot and it was slowly untying all the pieces of the knot. Well, I can tell you because we're connected on Facebook that, that you look great. And more importantly, like you could just tell that your, your light is back, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I I feel it. It's not even about how I look. I mean, it's lovely to be able to, I'm not going to lie. It's lovely to be able to buy cute clothes because clothes for fat women are usually not really very cute. (laughs) Um, Big prints, ugly fabrics, textures. I don't, I'm a very tactile person and I, I, so I'm very picky about textures of clothes, all of that stuff. So for me, the clothes were always horrible and I love being able to wear cute clothes, but for me, it's more about what I can do. And the fact that I can um, go visit my son at school and walk around campus with him and that I can dance. I can dance. You know, I was dancing one day, uh, in, in my Nia class and I burst into tears because I thought I've wanted to dance for how long? Because I've always, <laughs> I've always danced in my head, mm-hmm. you know, but I just physically just was not capable of it. My body hurt too badly. I was in constant pain and constant lack of energy and, and all of those things. And the fact that I can do that, and it's it's because I got rid of the inflammation and the weight came off because I got rid of the inflammation and the things that were causing that inflammation and making the weight stay on as a protective mechanism. So I believe, um, and I know that there are a lot of people who uh, you know, and I was very involved in really wanting, I think you need to accept yourself for who you are, no matter how you look, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's really important. And I have no judgment for anybody of any size, because we all have things we're struggling with. But I truly believe that obesity is not a the primary disease, like we look at it with the medical within the medical community. Now, I believe obesity and type two diabetes are symptoms of something else. Mm. And once you take care of the cause of that, which is the food we eat, the processed, inflammatory, high sugar, high chemical, all of that, right? Um, Once we take care of that and get our diets under control, we stop having the cravings, we start getting the energy, the inflammation goes away, we can move better. When we can move better, we, we can make better choices. 
for ourselves and for our own health. So it's all about creating this vibrant good health. And that's what I write about. I've written two books for people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis on the cookbook side that can help people with any type of autoimmune disease to start to get their life back like I've been able to. Well, when I play this back, I'm going to be taking notes, trust me, because <laughs> I'm right in the middle of all that. So, <laughs> uh, Well, anyway, I can help you. You know how to get in, get in touch with me. Well, Karen, we've arrived at that portion of the show. Do you know where I'm going? Uh, I'm going to say probably shameless self-promotion. Yay! Do you have any shameless self-promotion? Well, so you can find me. I have two different websites because, as I mentioned, I think earlier, I have to brand, split my brands, right? Mm -hmm. So I believe the metaphysical paranormal one is author Karen Frazier, F R A Z I E R dot com. And the cookbook health stuff is Karen Frazier dot com. So author Karen Frazier dot com, Karen Frazier dot com. You can um, follow me on Twitter, although I almost never say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and that's at author K Fraz, K F R A Z. And I think on Facebook, I'm author Karen Frazier. And, you know, I also am always just welcome to people who want to learn more about health or who want to work, learn more about energy healing or get more in touch with their psychic stuff. You can get in touch with me. You can get in touch with me through my website. You can find me on Facebook. And I'm always open because my whole goal in life is to help people to explore these topics in their own lives because I think it's so enriching. Um, and also Paranormal Underground Radio in the Dark on MixLR on Thursday nights from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Pacific. And uh, the magazine is Paranormal Underground Magazine, which is at paranormalunderground.net. Well. I've never listened to the show live. That's one of these days I'm going to actually show up and do that. I've al I've always just listened to the podcast version. But you totally rock. I was listening the other night, and I've been listening for about two years now. And I just thought, well, duh. Why <laughs> have you not contacted Karen about being on the show? I feel like I resonate with you so much. So it's it's awesome to listen to you, and you're such a fun person. And I'm so glad you came on. You rock. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's been fun. You're listening to The Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Look for us on iTunes and be sure to check out bigseance.com for more discussion. Okay. Time to light that extra candle. This week's spectral edition is entitled Ruined by Reputation. Here's Tim Prossel. Thank you, Patrick. Welcome to Spectral Edition, in which I read actual ghost reports published in U.S. newspapers between the years of 1865 and 1918. I have an article here that shows that even the reputation of a place being haunted can cause serious problems. This was published on September 9th of 1910 in the Shawnee Daily Herald out of Oklahoma. The title is Spooks Can't Be Evicted, So Ancient Building Will Be Torn Down. From the New York Evening Telegram, Wilbertus, New Jersey. Superstition, which peoples the ancient structure with mysterious and terrifying occupants who weep, wail, laugh weirdly, dance, and even fight at different times, threatens the further existence of one of the oldest buildings in New Jersey. Situated near this place, the structure is a deserted colonial grist mill, standing near a McAdam Road much frequented by automobilists. Historical societies and persons interested in the preservation of the ancient landmarks are trying to save the old mill, but it is likely it will be torn down within a few days. The reputation of the place as being haunted is not confined to the residents of the neighborhood. Persons who have passed the scene at night in automobiles have told strange stories of gruesome sights and sounds as they passed by the old building. Some of those who have had the experience once now go miles out of their way rather than pass it late at night. Among the countless legends which have clustered around the haunted mill is one concerning a young man of the neighborhood who went to investigate the place alone about 15 years ago. The mill, even at that time, had acquired a doubtful reputation, and the young man, a farmer, said he was determined to find out for himself just what was inside. He went in, but no one but him ever knew what he saw. 
for he was a raving maniac when he emerged from the old grist mill, and he remained in that condition until his death. The tradition upon which the reputation of the haunted mill as a resort for unearthly visitors is based tells the story of a young man who lured his betrothed into the building more than half a century ago. They were to be married the next day. According to the story, the youth slew the girl and afterward took his own life. Stories are told how at least four other persons have committed suicide in the old mill and how two or three other persons have been murdered there. Such is the ill repute of the mill that even if the municipal authorities decide to tear it down, it is expected to be extremely difficult to get men to do the work. You've been listening to Spectral Edition. I'm Tim Prossel, and I have more than 200 of these articles. I post another one each Wednesday on my new website, The Merry Ghost Hunter, M-E-R-R-Y Ghost Hunter. I hope you stop by. So what are your thoughts about my conversation with Karen Frazier? Let me know. And guess what? It's already summer vacation here, so next week I'll have a bonus episode for you. It's a conversation with author and researcher the Rosemary Ellen Guiley. It was an honor to talk to her. It's about time, and I'm excited to share the conversation. That's next week. Don't forget to go to podcastawards.com and vote for the big seance podcast. Additional music in today's episode is by the always fabulous Kevin McLeod, and the link to his website can be found in the show notes. Peace out, Paranerds. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit bigseance.com. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and we've just been added to the Google Play Music Store. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line at 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time. <laughs>